Good morning. I'm going to stand here to say good morning. So my name is Paulette de Sormo. I'm, I'm no one here. I'm just a moderator. <laughs> but I just want to give you, uh, I just want to greet you good morning today and tell you that I admire you all for being here at 8.30 in the morning. So please, let's clap to you. Bravo. We are very, very happy that you are here. We are from Latin America. I want to know who here is from Latin America. Okay. And uh, who does not speak English? Well, sorry, Spanish? Okay. So we're going to do this, of course, in English. And there, if there is any moment in which our panelists have an issue with that, uh, I'll just translate, okay? So, you came to this panel on um, Narcophiles, the new criminal order. That is a really exciting title. And what we are going to do this hour and a half is that we are going to talk about what is this investigation, how was it done. We know it started with a leak. I don't know if you've read the investigation or if you, have, if you saw it on the website earlier, but don't worry, uh, our team here is going to explain every detail, and we're going to focus on how did, did it start, how did they organize the information and the team of journalists, what elements were relevant, and I'm going to ask you to pay attention because I will uh, come back to you to ask certain questions so that we do it a little bit more interactive. Is that fine for you? Yes? Okay, great. Um, so... This project was coordinated by an organization that's called OCCRP, which is the Organized Crime Corruption Reporting Project. Okay? Have you heard of it before? Yeah, most people know. Okay, so I'll tell you that OCCRP has over 15 years of experience and has coordinated several transnational organizations, uh, uh, investigations, to make uh, journalists be able to basically cover corruption. As we know, corruption is not something that happens just in one country, and it's a way of operating normally crosses borders. So for us journalists, I'm, I'm an investigative journalist from Chile, for us journalists, it's really important to be able to count with an organization that knows how to help us work together uh, following corruption. So, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and we're going to start the conversation. We have first Daniela Castro. Clap for Daniela. <laughs> hey. So Daniela is based in Bogota. She's a Colombian investigative journalist. She joined OCCRP back in 2017, started as a reporter, and now she's a South America editor. Uh, she coordinates investigations and edits stories alongside journalists in the region. Then we have Daniel, David Gonzalez. Clap for David as well. <laughs> He's the only man in this panel. I want to know that. Thank you uh, for joining us, David. He uh, is a senior editor for investigations for OCCRP. He's from Venezuela, and he's an investigative journalist and editor. Thank you, David. Lilia Saul is based in Mexico. You see, this is already a very transnational team. She is an investigative reporter for OCCRP since 2019 mm -hmm. and has participated in various transnational investigations in partnership with Mexican media. Did we clap to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Claudia Baez. She is the CEO and co-founder of the Colombian independent investigative media called Question Publica. She's a multi-award winning journalist star, so we're very happy that we have her here. Uh, I will just say that uh, Narcophiles was possible because there was a leak in Colombia. Um, so it is super important that we have a journalist from Colombia and that has, if you don't know Question Publica, please follow it and uh, their social networks, then she can tell you exact, the exact address, but they're very innovative in Latin America, and I think that's very important in this panel, because what we see many times with corruption is that it's kind of hard to get, and both OCCRP and Cuestión Pública make a real effort in telling the story in a compelling way, in a way that each of us can understand it, even if we don't know uh, what's like behind the scheme, of, com complex scheme, right, of corruption. 
and we're going to try to have this panel in that exact way, okay, more like a conversation. If you have any really relevant question during the conversation, uh, differently from other panels, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we can, you know, address it immediately. So we're going to start with Daniela, who is going to tell us basically what is Narcofiles all about. Thanks, Paulette. So um, can we show the presentation, please? So this is Narcofiles, the new criminal order. Um, we have here, we want to play a video, please. Thanks. Um, so as you saw in the video, um, this was the first uh, investigative project uh, that was focused on transnational organized crime. Uh, the driving force was <laughs> Latin America. Uh, we have a very strong um, network uh, of partners in Latin America. Um, so this was really important um, for the investigation. Um, this um, project um, with the investigations that we published, we were able to uncover how criminal uh, groups operate, how they collaborate with each other, uh, but also the innovations in criminal practices. Um, Lilia and Claudia are going to um, talk a little bit more uh, about the investigations that were done uh, in, in Mexico and in Colombia that show like um, these elements. But um, this was like very um, important and um, what really was the, the project about. Uh, so, as Paulette was saying, this is, um, this is a project that originated from uh, a leak uh, from the prosecutor's office in Colombia. Uh, it was a massive leak uh, of seven million emails. Um, it included also PDFs, um, videos, photos. Um, it contained very sensitive material. There was personal information about witnesses and uncovered agents um, and other uh, people like uh, giving information to Colombian authorities. Um, so this was really important when we were working with, uh, with the partners, with the reporters, uh, because we wanted to make sure that the information that was published in the investigations didn't reveal like any information from third parties, but only of the people that we are were actually investigating. Um, and well, as, as I mentioned, Latin America was a, a driving force uh, in this project. Um, as probably many of you know, Colombia is the main cocaine producer in the world. So you can imagine that in the, in the, in the leak, there was a lot of information about drug, drug trafficking. Uh, but with this project, what we wanted to show was that this was not only a Colombian problem, but just but a global problem. Um, so even one of the stories that were published uh, as part of the project was about um, coca crops that were uh, being um, cultivated in, in Central America. So we have been seeing uh, the movement of um, coca production from South America to Central America. Um, so, so this is just one to give to give you an example of of uh, of this um, uh, global problem of drug trafficking. Um, now, the the because this project was uh, focused on transnational organized crime and uncovering um, transnational organized crime, it had like a very uh, important component on security uh, for the reporters. So, since the beginning. Uh, we established a um, security committee that David is going to explain a bit more later, um, but we have a lot of protocols, security protocols. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the reporters were safe during the reporting process because sometimes we uh, speak uh, only about like if or the discussions go around whether or not uh, the reporters will sign the, the article. But it's really, you need to really be careful about uh, the reporting process as well. Because if, even if you don't uh, sign an, an article, if you have been um, asking for information about a certain person or a company um, that has been involved in corruption or criminal activity, then still they can trace back, you know, like know who, who's asking about the, the information, for the information. So 
Just one thing. So Daniela just mentioned a really important point, right, which is security, and we're going to uh, go deeper in that area later. But I want you, as she speaks, I want you to think on what are the elements that are really important to be able to do something like this. We're talking about five terabytes of data. This is more than seven million emails. So think about that. Like, how do you analyze seven million emails, right? It's hard when we have like 15 in the inbox. So let's see uh, what ideas you have, because uh, they're going to go in depth with that. You, wanna, you want to hear from them now, or you want to continue? Yeah, if, if, they, if you can uh, give okay. us like, some ideas of which I elements. Need to know, I need to know from you. So what do we need to organize a team of journalists that is going to dive into how many, seven million emails? Seven million emails to try to find these connections that are going to enable us to tell stories about drug trafficking around the world, basically. Who has any idea? What is important? OK. You have a microphone there. What's your name and where are you from? Uh, my name is Andrea. I am from Colombia. I work in Transparencia Pro Colombia, the national chapter of Transparency International in my country. And well, um, I think that it, data analysis, uh, data science, I think it's a lot of information. So in a way, like technology applied to the analysis of this information. Right, anyone else has a different idea? Here, please. Um, hi, I'm Nanuka from Georgia, and I'm a CCRP fellow. Um, first of all, I mean, uh, it's important to know uh, how large the team was who was working on this data, and after how the job was divided. And for example, as for analyzing, for sure, not sure for sure, but I think uh, probably you had created some uh, keywords uh, and uh, maybe some tool, and after you were like um, searching uh, and diving on this huge data with your main keywords, and yeah. Okay, so methodology. Uh, after the, there would be some crosses probably and stuff, and yeah. Okay. This is how I, I think now, but. Thank you. So, an idea of how we need to develop methodology. Anyone else? Okay, Daniela, tell us about it. Yeah, so you mentioned. Um, well, here, what you were, were saying about the people involved, um, there were like 40 media outlets, 23 countries, and seven, 70 stories that we published. Uh, only Latin America, there were about or more than seven, 70 partners. Uh, so the part of like, you know, handling uh, a collaboration with so many reporters um, was one of the things. So I'm going to mention um, some of the elements that have to do with that, but also with the, with the data. Um, element. So one thing is the infrastructure. We have seven million uh, emails. So where do we put like this information that it's searchable and we can start like looking and finding informations? So we have a platform called mm -hmm. Aleph uh, where we have uh, the information. It's, it's possible for reporters to uh, look for keywords. Uh, so that makes the the search uh, more easy. Um, also, the communication between the partners, so many people involved, um, the communication has to be secure. So we have um, established signal uh, chats. Um, and also, there is a platform that we have that is called the Wiki, uh, which is like a, a place that uh, all the reporters can put the information, um, and it's also going to be um, secure. Um, because one of the other things that are important, and here I mentioned the rules, is that everyone has to share the information and share the findings and collaborate. Um, this is very important for a project like this uh, to be successful. Um, then uh, the other rule is that nobody uh, is going to publish before one, one day that we all establish. Um, that's also really important, and handling like so many partners and making sure that nobody is going to publish before the, the publication date that it was agreed is, is also very important for the, if you have like a very strong network um, and there's trust uh, within the partners that are working in the collaboration, um, it's also part of um, a, a, a successful uh, project. Um, one of the other elements is the coordinator. Uh, this is really important role, a leadership role. Basically, it's, uh, it's the person who's going to be uh, making sure that 
uh, the, the project moves forward. These are, these are investigations that take months uh, to be done. So it's really important to have somebody who keeps the project moving um, to make sure that everyone is sharing the information, that there is collaboration. Uh, we have uh, OCCRP has a global network. So we have editors, uh, reporters, and member centers all over the world. So uh, this coordination also, this coordinator also has to make sure that, um, sorry that uh, build bridges between the Latin America um, reporters and the reporters and editors that are um, around the world. Um, so yeah, those, those were the, the, the main elements, infrastructure, communication, um, the rules um, have very clear rules and, and the coordination. We have a question there. Can we get a microphone, please? Thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Baker. I work for a research consultancy. Um, and I have a question concerning this collaboration. Uh, I understand that this leak came from the Attorney General's office. How do you uh, ensure that you don't interfere with ongoing investigations? Um, did you also set up communication lines with, the, uh, with law enforcement and with uh, perhaps the Attorney General's office in this? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, yeah, it's important to mention that this leak was just the starting point of the project. Uh, we, um, after we find like some leads, we sent <coughs> FOIA requests to the attorney's office to get more information about the different cases. Um, we also check company records, property records. Um, even there's like in Colombia, it's possible to check um, ongoing cases uh, with a case number. Some some of them. Like you, you don't find them, but it's pretty um, like an open uh, database where you can find like basic information, and then you can request more information through a FOIA request to the prosecutor's office. So it was really a discussion uh, when we were deciding which um, stories we wanted to publish because we, would, we didn't want to interfere uh, with some of the ongoing investigations. But we found out that there were some investigations that were years, the you know, in the investigation stage. So we thought that those investigations uh, needed to be told, um, and we gave the, the prosecutor's office the opportunity to give us more information about it. So, yeah. So here we are talking about um, drug trafficking, right? Like organized corruption. And some journalists not necessarily have a lot of experience uh, you know, with that, or some media don't have the capacity always to protect uh, their journalists and their sources. So, can you tell us, David, a bit more about this? How did you manage security, safety? Well, uh, yes. Um, security is a, uh, I, I have to say something before starting. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the Latin American Center on Investigative uh, Journalism, <coughs> which is CLIP, was a, a partner who had uh, which helped us with the coordination of the, the whole project, which is a very important detail to, to keep in mind here. And it's a very strong ally in the, in the region, Latin America. And yet, yeah, uh, OCCRP uh, has a, a very, very strong, uh, uh, you know, protocols and a structure design in order to uh, provide security to journalists that are working in, the, in their projects. We have a, a you know, a, a, a responsible for digital security, we have a responsible for uh, physical security, and we have a strong protocols that we have to follow, uh, and we take care that, that these uh, protocols are, are followed in a very rigorous way in order to prevent uh, any, anything. Um, in this case, uh, I mean, we, we can talk uh, about, I, I just want to, to do a brief, a, brief, a brief presentation of this part and then in the Q&A we, we can uh, go deep on, on this. But uh, the, what Daniela was uh, telling us is that we, we have a very special situation here because of the scope of the, 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 scope of the project. I mean, there you have a, a situation in which you have a, a large team, not only in Latin America, but you know, connected with other, other regions in the, in the world. You have uh, reporters that, that are, um, are based in most of the risk, uh, risky countries of, of the world, like, such as Mexico and Colombia. You have an unprecedented kind 
project, I, I can, I, we, we think that we can call it in that way, uh, because you are working with a, with a leak with very sensitive information, and you will, you, you were planning to publish pretty much at the same time, talking about, this, uh, you know, a, a wide range of, of, of topics related to uh, uh, organized crime. So, you, you have a, a problem there, and, and we try to think how to approach to this and to provide the best way possible to, 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 you know, to be there with the partners and with our, our journalists. So, uh, we usually work in three dimensions that are, that are explicit, the, the digital side, in which, as Daniela has, has explained, uh, to provide you know, all protocols in order to work safely in the digital platforms, uh, including the LCCRP ones, uh, a physical uh, security angle, in which is, was a, a protocol, a very strict protocol of how, how, to, how to work on this, uh, that covers even, uh, how to ask, uh, in which term you will ask uh, official information in, in a, a public request uh, petition, for example, or in which condition you will uh, get a one-to-one -one interview, you know, and this kind of, of, of situation. And then an, an, editorial, an editorial side, uh, since the, 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 the leak have, uh, has a lot of information, sensitive, uh, as Daniela said, about witness, about ongoing investigations. Yeah. So uh, there was a, a meeting uh, uh, in, in which uh, a, a, you know, a lar large part of the team was gathered in, pre in presence. I mean, I guess you. Uh, I, I think I saw in your presentation a picture of that. Uh, yeah. You <laughs> yeah. Know? yeah. I, I think no. I, I I think I very conserve security and I. That's good. You put it. <laughs> so that is exactly an example of what you're mentioning, yeah. right? We protect yeah. the identity of exactly. the journalists that are working we, here. We we had a, a photo of that meeting and I decided to to. Take out. Take out. Yeah. In order to protect people that were there in that meeting. Yes. This is the kind of thing that we are thinking over and over and over and every second, and it was done like, yeah, <laughs> just recently done. <laughs> yeah. Great. So uh, I think the 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 most interesting uh, con one of the most interesting conclusions uh, of this meeting was uh, that we thought as a as a you know as a large team not only OCCRP but partners as, as well uh, that the, we needed a, a committee uh, that can uh, work with security issues and uh, some editorials and ethical issues that can that can that may arise during the investigation process so we think it, it was not necessarily uh, uh, in that way in the protocols but we creative think about that and we say yes we have to create that so we write a protocol about that committee it sounds like a lot of bureaucracy but not it was very you know very uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It was very useful in the process. We created a, a set of rules of the operation of that committee, and we let uh, all partners know that we have this committee, and uh, all uh, could have access to, to the members uh, any time they need. So they could uh, ask about this uh, dangerous interview that I am going to do in a few hours, or they're going to ask mm -hmm. you ask us or an opinion of how how to manage this information uh, because it might be an ongoing investigation someone can be harmed so we were in a process talking in a everyday basis uh, in that way and I think uh, the, the committee uh, as I said it was a very interesting experience I can go uh, with examples uh, of what happened there, but uh, it was a very, very useful, in, you know, uh, instance to to talk about this and to prevent some some issues, to mo to get track of some incidents incidents that were happening, uh, and develop a strategic a strategy in order to, you know, there's not there's not such thing like a silver bullet or a full, complete, and perfect solution for this. 
there, there are risks in flying uh, when you are working in these kind of topics. But we were active, you know, working, trying to uh, be one step ahead of any situation that could have a, a develop a, the, um, not desirable develop, development. That I, can, I, I guess that I can say this at that mm -hmm. moment, and then uh, the Q&A. Thank you, David. Just to illustrate the danger that we are speaking about here, um, I want to recommend this documentary that some of us watched yesterday. It's called State of Silence. Was anyone there yesterday watching it? You were there, you? Okay, so three people. For those who haven't watched it, I strongly recommend it. It tells the story of four Mexican journalists that are uh, specifically covering um, narco politics, you could say, so, like the, these bonds between um, the corruption at the government and uh, drug trafficking or organized crime in general. Um, and I think that the director is here and one of the journalists who suffered the consequences of the threats and the aggressions is also here. His name is Jesus. And I think that uh, watching the documentary or speaking to them is going to help us really understand why what David is saying is so important. Why this thing as uh, we had a picture of the team and we decided to take it out, those are the reflections that actually matter when you are dealing with organized crime. You need to protect your team. And even that detail, posting a picture at a conference, can make the whole difference. So speaking about Mexico, I want to hear from Lilia. Um, you are based in Mexico, you are Mexican, you have a lot of experience covering this. How was it for you? What did you discover there? Okay, um, can put the presentation. Ah. <clears throat> can you play that video, please? You. In het Nederlandse poortvliet vlak bij de haven van Antwerpen staat een lichter laaien. Is dit toeval? En wat gebeurde er in die schuur? Knak sprak met een ooggetuige. Zij zag de brand op 27 maart 2020. Let's stop it. Yeah. So just tell us in your words. Yeah, what yeah. were we seeing? Uh, okay. Uh, I try to speak in English, but uh, sometimes maybe switch in Spanish. Sorry. <laughs> but let's Paulette. give like, let's clap Lilia, because she's making <laughs> an effort, okay? No, no, no. I try, I try. Because it's We're very here for you. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. It's very early to speak in English. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the the images uh, you're watching are of an explosion in a small town in the Netherlands. The the name of the port, the the small town is Port Bullet. I never has been there, but uh, it's not just uh, you see an explosion. Uh, it's an explosion of a drug laboratory, and that drug laboratory. Uh, you can imagine it's uh, connected with uh, Mexican people, uh, Colombian people to uh, drug laboratory in this end point. And uh, well, uh, documents obtained in the leak from the Colombia's prosecutor offices uh, were the starting point to investigate it. Because uh, in, in, in the team, see uh, our documents, our different documents uh, to ask about of the information. For example, in this case in Netherlands, to um, ask about of the uh, information about of that people uh, in Colombia and in Mexico too. Never answer, but uh, that's start uh, for us to uh, start the investigation because, uh, sorry, need to switch in Spanish. Porque encontramos que en estos documentos eh, de la Fiscalía eh, de Colombia, no, de Países Bajos. Okay, so we found out that in these documents from the public prosecutor in the Netherlands, estaban conectados con eh, mexicanos, con colombianos que traficaban droga y lavaban dinero. Were connected with Mexican and Colombian people that were money laundering and traffic drugs. <laughs> she knows how to speak English. Yeah, that, thanks to them, OCCRP reporters and their partners in, in Mexico, Colombia, Spain, and the Netherlands, we were able to connect the dots of apparent isolated events that had uh, occurred in those countries. Uh, in this investigative uh, work, um, 
work with Jim, the um, Quinto Elemento Lab, Aristegui Noticias, and uh, Mexicanos Contra la Corrupción. And um, do it a uh, field work, interviews uh, with source, and cross-referencing of official records were key to understanding what was uh, behind it. Uh, and found a flexible confederation of criminals of different nationalities uh, that had come together to make the operations possible. They used encrypted uh, communications like EncroChat you know, and innovative methods of drug transportation. Uh, for example, um, I, don't know say, I, I don't know how to say um, bloques de hormigón. Concrete blocks. <laughs> okay. And financial maneuvers uh, designed to keep them in, in the shadows. Their way of operating was a portrait of the ways of working of transnational organized crime in the present. The reporters, however, uh, found more. Uh, maybe change, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, they found evidence of a lack of investigation by Mexican authorities in key areas of the case. Eh, quisiera hablar un poco de esto en español. Eh, I want to speak about this part in Spanish. Para nosotros como periodistas fue importante observar que las autoridades en México eh, no investigaron absolutamente eh, nada de lo que nosotros como periodistas encontramos y que so for us as journalists, it was really important to find out that Mexican authorities did not investigate anything of what we as journalists could investigate. Y que encontramos que ya autoridades previamente de eh, Países Bajos y de España habían solicitado a sus pares en México y también en Colombia. And we are talking about information that the public prosecutors of the Netherlands and Spain had already requested to the national authorities in Mexico, and they had not investigated anything. Incluso en entrevistas con la Policía Nacional de España, eh, nos revelaron que eh, habían solicitado información directamente al eh, fiscal y a la Policía de México y no obtuvieron ninguna respuesta. El España. So um, they interviewed um, authorities, public prosecutor sources in, um, in Spain, and they confirmed that they had requested specifically to the public prosecutor and the police in Mexico really specific information that they had not provided. And according to what was saying Lilia before, just to wrap it up your first part, because I think it's really important, uh, what she's basically saying is that the investigation that Mexico or Colombia even did, the national authorities, the public prosecutors, did not consider what their partners, their peer organizations in these other countries had also investigated. So in a way, an alliance like, uh, between journalists like OCCRP and CLIP leads and the value of having Question Publica, for example, and all the other national media join the investigation is that they were able to connect dots that their national authorities were not connecting because they don't know how to collaborate, apparently, and journalists do know. Mm -hmm. So do you want to give us more examples? Yes. Uh, yes, as you say, uh, some challenge like a, a journalist during the research uh, all the journalists no access to information from judicial investigations uh, in Mexico, obviously. No access to court uh, documents, uh, for example, in this case, uh, the journalists going to the uh, hearing uh, for obtain uh, different information about of, of, of our cases uh, to investigate. And there are no accessible sources in Mexico and Colombia. And, um, What's mean about that? For example, in our case in Mexico, the prosecutor is uh, very uh, unexpected. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to talk with any uh, authority in Mexico, uh, for example, in this case. Only uh, the open cases in Mexico about the prosecutor, prosecutor office, it's about corruption or uh, criminal cases about against of, um, human rights. But even in these cases, it's sometimes it's very difficult to obtain documents or uh, information about of the stories in, in investigating in process. 
And that's the reason uh, in organized crime, it's more difficult to obtain uh, the data. Uh, other challenge, uh, get reliable uh, sources, uh, anti-corruption prosecutor. For example, in this case, talk uh, with um, uh, 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 one prosecutor, uh, anti-corruption is the name uh, official in Mexico, but even she said, I can't to share information and I can uh, know information about the, this case uh, um, to show in narco files because she, uh, the, the, even in, in the prosecutor, the different prosecutors in Mexico don't share information with another prosecutor, in, in this case, up the corruption. Uh, and uh, that's the reason it was difficult for her to share information with us. Uh, get the final version of the criminals. Uh, for example, in this case, OCCRP, the method of, of OCCRP, it's every day uh, too. Um, at the final of the investigation, needs to do a right of response uh, to share a questionnaire to the, all the people involved in the investigation. And even in this case, it's a uh, um, need to talk with the narco drugs or narco dealers, sorry. Uh, in this case, for example, in this investigation, I uh, uh, need to talk with uh, Ojos Bojorquez, it's the uh, name of the one guy to, 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 uh, to investigate it in, in this case. And need to talk with his lawyers. And sometimes uh, in different cases, talk about or think about of the, uh, it's a risk or not a risk sometimes, but needs to, to, to talk and with that people and close the fact uh, checking with last minute information that uh, confirmed our hypothesis. And in, in this case, uh, obtain information about uh, one guy uh, to uh, investigate it in, in Mexico. Uh, he answered, uh, accept some of our hypotheses on his connections with partners with criminal records. And last, but not uh, least, <laughs> our conclusions, uh, we should be proud uh, that a journalist network investigate, uh, investigates beyond its uh, borders. Sometimes I feel like, uh, sorry, I, I need to say in Spanish, hacemos el trabajo que no hacen los a eh, eh, las autoridades porque pareciera que no quieren compartir información ni siquiera entre las mismas autoridades. So uh, sometimes I feel as a journalist that we are doing the work that authorities should do because apparently they don't even want to collaborate among them, like even in different departments on the same country. Pero sin el budget de, los, de las autoridades. But without the budget of authorities. <laughs> uh, let's achieve uh, more progress than the authorities themselves. Uh, let's get investigations proof of any lawsuit. Uh, uh, the importance of transnational investigations. Okay, I want to clap, ah, yeah. please clap for Lee. No, yeah. no, no, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the effort. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, Go I ahead. want to, to add some, some remarks uh, on what Lilia mm -hmm. has said. Um, it, in, in this specific case, the, the importance of the Mexican partners in identifying the story. I mean, yeah. they, they were following news in Mexico related to the, you know, the investigation of a kind of scandal with a guy who runs a financial firm. And they connect that case, thanks to the, the leak, with, a, I mean, we, we are talking about a daily links, uh, but the, the evidence uh, connect the operation of this firm with some people that were doing, running uh, drug trafficking processing mm -hmm. overseas, connecting Colombia, connecting Mexico, connect, uh, through Spain, until they uh, uh, reach uh, the Netherlands. So the, 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 the way they identify the story and then how to they manage to uh, ask uh, the help of, help of uh, Dutch reporters. We have the, the help of a uh, Belgium reporter and Spain reporters in order to complete the you know 
the, the puzzle the was, was, was incredible. I mean, it yeah. was, was a, 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 and they discovered in some cases the Spanish information about the case, part of the, of the information was public by the, the police. And the same happened with the, you know, the, the case in the Netherlands, and the coverage of the, the explosion was part of, of this uh, thing. So they were, you know, identifying point by point in order to get, a, a, you know, a picture of a very, I mean, unknown uh, network of criminals that involved people from, like, six or seven different nationalities and that. It's very, very interesting process here yeah, and results. A real transnational um, corruption, right? Yeah. Organized. Um, okay, so one thing that I want to mention here is that we just put a lot of emphasis in seven million emails, which is data. We put emphasis on the infrastructure you need. We put emphasis on security, but actually what made the difference was people were reporters, right? And what made the difference were the sources that they talked with. So it's not just data, it's how we report on that data, okay? And it's the people that we talk and the access we have to human sources. So that's a really big difference. And one more thing, do I have government officials in the room? Can you raise your hand? I see some here. Okay, <laughs> no one he here, okay. A message to you. <laughs> Push for collaboration in your countries. It's not that journalists outsmart other people, it's that just they care about fighting corruption, we care about fighting corruption, and we are willing to collaborate with each other. Maybe if your governments collaborate with other governments and build networks of trust, respecting all the protocols that you may have, well, maybe you, who care about fighting corruption because you wouldn't be here otherwise, can make a difference. And then we, as journalists, can cover other stories. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Colombia. Colombia. Let's speak about Claudia. Can we switch to the next uh, presentation, the PPT? PPT. Well, uh, start speaking Okay. Right now. There, there so, we are, um, we are uh, partners of uh, OCCRP, Question Publica. Uh, we just uh, recently uh, became uh, investigative associated uh, to OCCRP. And we joined uh, uh, Narcofiles. Uh, just to, to let you know, this is the, the, the huge, uh, the, the unprecedented leak from the Colombian attorney office. And uh, was, yes, five terabytes of information, but compressed. When you uncompress all the information, it's more than eight terabytes, okay? So that uh, media outlets in Colombia, so many, almost everyone, had that um, information because there was a hacktivist called Guacamayas that um, uh, take advantage of a failure in the uh, mail system on uh, the um, um, attorney office to extract all this information during months. That's not my... No. no. That's not the presentation, if we can try to find the right one. Thank you. Um, so they extract all this information um, during months and they uh, shared all the package to uh, deny secrets, uh, DDS. Um, there was a safe word of this information. And if you wanted to uh, have a grant access to the information, you should to send um, a request to them and they uh, verify if you were a journalist or not and give you access to this huge, massive information. So I think that my presentation is, will be there. Yeah. So, uh, once you have, but DDS, that is the, the soft, safe word of this information, has not, uh, uh, they couldn't, I mean, you, you got a link, a link in, in your email, right? So, okay, <laughs> this is um, that we, we did, and 
that's what I'm talking about. This unprecedented hacking in Colombia is distributed denial of secrets. And this is, uh, for, example, for instance, is our uh, ex uh, former uh, Attorney General of Colombia, uh, Francisco Barbosa. And uh, under his administration, attorneys of his system was hacked in this massive LA lake. This is the size of the lake. It's 2.5, uh, the size of Panama Papers. I mean, it's, it's, it's massive. And they can enter to the system of the attorney's office as they own in the place. Because a problem, an informatic problem, is just they have a third party ruling their system, and this third party company didn't take care about security. So, as journalists in, in Colombia, Cuestión uh, Pública, as everyone, has to dive in, dive in, in a massive tons of data. And all the emails are not only worthy. I mean, you have emails like from which, uh, from uh, benefits, social benefits, so uh, the, the party of a uh, team, uh, team party, something like that. So not all the information on these tons terabytes of uh, information are, are worthy. So you, we, we have to really uh, spend a lot of m hours and times and try to uh, look for the best way to really find the gold on it. And Cuestión Pública uh, published two biggest investigations. The first one is how a narco and his family was um, um, had shares in the main port in Colombia. I mean, they were uh, part of the, even his family was part of the board uh, of directors of the main port in Colombia, a narco that was really trafficking on the time he was uh, owner of these shares in the port. And the other one is that one, the favorite uh, shipping companies of the Colombian mafia. How the Colombian mafia find a way, a gray zone in the maritime, international maritime trafficking to take advantage of the lines at the root of the Merck's company and CMA, the main shipping company in the world, to traffic in drugs and take the drug to, to Europe. So this is the first one. Half a million shares of the Bonaventura port in the hands of a drug lord and his family. For years, I mean, this guy, as Gustavo Adolfo Vega Archful. She, he received thousands of dollars for trafficking uh, drugs in, chip, in shipping, and from cocaine, uh, shipping the drug to the United States. And during, he was receiving money from this uh, tra uh, drug trafficking. He was, uh, he had shares in the, in, the, in the company, in the port. Even, his, uh, uh, ex, uh, his wife uh, was uh, in the um, local government in, in the city of the port and uh, was l close to political. This is the former president of Colombia, Ivan Duque. So this is a kind of, of uh, power and, and connections that uh, family, drug families, uh, uh, drug trafficking families alert can get in Colombia. So. Family members of this drug lord was had seat on the uh, board of directors and in, in the board. This is uh, this is, was the first one, and the next one is uh, the favorite shipping companies of the Colombian mafia. I don't know if can I put play here. Okay. Ah! <laughs> So, Cusi Publica wants to, okay, oh, okay. How Colombian cocaine travels the world. And we try to package this investigation that connects Latin America, Colombian cocaine uh, with the network in Europe, uh, how they 
made the trafficking, drug trafficking, from Colombia to uh, Europe. So uh, we identify with, with the, the, the documents that we take out from, from the, this lake, how criminals use codes uh, from these navy, these shipping, shipping companies to say all the drugs ha has to go through um, containers uh, uh, which owners are Merckx or um, CMA, the terminals that they have here in Belgium in numbers. And why they use these lines, these routes that are, are legal, I mean, is, is the international maritime trafficking, right? So they use all the logistics, all the operation, the supply chain, that it's already that it's efficient, that really works to uh, try to cover the, the drug, to contaminate container, and uh, find a way to uh, traffic, the, traffic in the drug uh, onto, onto Europe. So we create an inedit database. I mean, it's an unprecedented database, crossing uh, reference from five uh, um, information authorities' information, like uh, the police, attorney's offices, uh, even uh, authorities in Belgium, um, Navy in Colombia. I mean, that was a massive uh, work to uh, uh, review the database uh, record by record. That was a manual thing to do and identify who were the owners of the vessels or, or the ships, which company, a shipping company, were, were the owner of this, of, of this uh, seizures, because it's a, it's a seizures database from Colombia. And that, that was a way that we find out how, how the criminals use, uh, take advantage of, of the um, logistic uh, supply chain. Uh, we identify uh, Colombia, uh, Colombian attorney office uh, really in, in the emails has the, the, the message that criminals uh, share to chip and pick out which vessel or which uh, container in which terminal port the drug should, should go. So that was 1,700 um, cases that we reported and, and we consolidated in, in the whole database. And uh, we got uh, like 1,200 tons of cocaine in, in, the, in the whole database. At, at, it is an unprecedented uh, database, built by Colombia with by Costion Publica, and really have uh, give a light on how you how, how authorities can take a look on, on, on this uh, phenomenon. It's, it's not a isolated case. It's not a isolated thing when you say, okay, another seizure was uh, reported in um, Ambers or was reported in uh, Spain or was reported in Costa Rica. No, it's, it's, it's how you could really can explain the whole phenomenon and say it's not an isolated thing. It's, it's, it's a really big thing. And this is the mechanism of uh, Colombian mafia are really uh, be, be efficient in, in, in the drug trafficking. Um, yeah? yeah. <laughs> so let me just, uh, um, let me... Okay, while you find that, I just wanna say that it's important that it's not one database, right? It was not one data set. Claudia mentioned how she was able and her team was able to find the connections of this drug lord with uh, or having shares, he and his family, at the most important port. So you cannot do that if you only look to one data set. You need to cross that information through an investigative methodology with other data uh, in general in your country and abroad. Let's, let's see your video. Yeah, uh, I just want to finish because I think we don't have too much time. But what is the impact of an investigation, of, of this, this kind of investigation? When we release uh, narco files, was published uh, with the whole media outlets, 40 media outlets around the world. The president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, uh, mentioned it. The investigation mentioned it. Question publica and in, in, in different uh, public events, saying that uh, the drug uh, uh, politics uh, regarding how Colombian government is, is combating and fighting. Uh, this, this phenomenon should change because uh, 
the journalists made the work, uh, made the investigation for this. So they um, mentioned it, the, the investigation. So I then, and also uh, they uh, quoted a question public as uh, uh, tweets in, in, in X and uh, the publication uh, that we did about uh, the narco shirts and, and, and this. Um, also, uh, the, uh, the publication prompted an official statement from the Port Society of Buenaventura, the, the port that, that we reported, and also was mentioned during a meeting with the German uh, Minister of, uh, of uh, Internal uh, in relation to drug trafficking in port cities. And uh, many other media outlets recovered, republished our, our investigation. So this is the team that uh, made this, uh, because this is a collaborative uh, work and is needed a huge, a, a good team, but a collaborative team too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> Do we have questions? There, please. Hi, good morning, thanks. My name is uh, Gabrielle, working for Acuris Research Consultancy. And actually, this afternoon, I'll be speaking at a panel where we're discussing uh, corruption vulnerabilities in the European ports. So it's very interesting, Claudia, what you're discussing just now. And I was wondering, did you see any operational changes that were made in the ports or around the ports? Because what you just mentioned on impact, it was much more high level, I would say, which is good. But did you see any let's say, practical changes? I, I think um, when we made the, 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 we asked to Merckx and CMA uh, about, regarding our findings, they answered to us that uh, the name, the number of seizures in their containers and vessels and all that uh, should be like a, a good, uh, thing, a, a good thing, because they collaborate a lot with the authorities. That was how they defend themselves in, in our uh, collaboration. And I think that that's not the answer. I mean, I, I think really that the, the international maritime trafficking and the supply chain cha has, has to be uh, more controlled. I mean, more controlled and filtered, because they have people that are contaminated and corrupted in the in the in the the process, okay, and how can we deal with that? I mean, how, how we can really show uh, put a light on this gray zone that criminals are taking advantage of? So I think it's, it's something about collaboration, but it's something about uh, technology. I mean, AI. They they need that kind of uh, a sophisticated technology to really track. How, how are the ways of criminal are using on, on the supply chain and all the process? I, I think that will be that. Thanks. Also, the, these stories are really important because they, they don't just tell an anecdote, like a specific episode. They point out to the failures in a system that uh, allows for this specific case to happen, right? Like this lab that was set on fire uh, in the Netherlands, you mention it, it's not something isolated. So if we as journalists just tell the story as something isolated, and if people uh, like public officials just investigate it as something like anecdotically, we will never be able to modify uh, our mechanisms of control to identify in the supply chain, right, where are the holes that enable corruption, organized crime, etc. So we need to look uh, in a broader way and find out what are the structural right, uh, spaces that we need to, to tackle. More questions over here. Comments? I have no question. Where are the journalists in this room? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. So, sorry, I already asked one, but if nobody raises their hands, I'm happy to ask another question to our uh, Mexican uh, colleague. And uh, thank you for, for speaking in, in English. So I'll, I'll try to ask you the question in Spanish. That's Yay. Perfect. Okay. Me gustaría saber cuáles son las causas de la falta de la colaboración entre las fiscalías 
¿Eso es cuestión de recursos o cuestión de, de captura política o, o corrupción? O, eh, ¿Cuáles son las causas? De, de, ¿Cuál es la raíz de eso? Corrupción. So, so maybe, should I, should I? Pero, yeah. ok, so, what, I, what I ask is, what, what are the causes that there is a lack of collaboration between the different uh, authorities in this case, or the different public prosecutor's offices? Yeah. yeah. Lo primero es corrupción. Sí, hay en varias oficinas mucha corrupción. No hay, eh, precisamente no hay esa colaboración. So one of the reasons for the lack of collaboration is corruption. So in his question, he said, is this a lack of resources? Is it a political capture or what's the reason? And the answer, the first thing is corruption. Yeah, in this case, uh, in, in our investigation about narcophiles in case of Mexico, uh, precisamente uno de los casos que muestra la mayor corrupción que puede haber es uno de nuestros, digamos, hombres investigados, está libre no porque sea inocente, sino porque el procedimiento fue corrompido por policías. So, what shows uh, or uh, uh, an important example of how the system is corrupted is that one of the, um, like a man that we were investigated is free, not because he's innocent or proven innocent uh, in court, but because there was corruption during the process uh, by the police. Mm -hmm. La policía hizo un cateo en esta oficina de, esta oficina de eh, servicios financieros. Esta persona lavaba dinero y esta persona argumentó que los policías le robaron dinero y por esa situación fue que la investigación no funcionó. Okay. So when the police went to allanar any raid. By, uh? raid. 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 Ah, raid. Uh, raid. Yes. Raid. So when the police went to raid the office of this person that was being investigated, uh, this man just said that the police had stolen money for him, from him. <laughs> so that annulated the whole raid. Eh, y eh, obviamente las eh, fiscalías intentan no compartirse la información para que no eh, ocurran este tipo de sucesos. Pero ad adicional a eso hay una falta de coordinación a nivel internacional, dicho incluso por mexicanos que eh, trabajan, por ejemplo, en la unidad de inteligencia financiera. So, um, there's not just a lack of coordination and collaboration between local authorities, but also at an international level. Um, que, eh, no hablan, por, ejemplo, uh, for example, they don't speak the same language. Like they don't speak... No, no, bueno, sí, tampoco no hablan English. <laughs> no hablan English. Pero además no, no hablan entre ellos como oficinas que son pares. Okay, so they don't speak uh, among each other as peer... Um, as peers, basically, at, at, at an authority level. So one public prosecutor from the Netherlands does, does not speak with the prosecutor from Mexico. Although the criminals do speak among them. <laughs> <laughs> Solo los criminales hablan entre sí. Muy bien. <laughs> do I, you I think, like, like, do you have another perspective from your countries? Is there a lack of resources or? No, I would like to add that uh, we have also seen like a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, between countries, so when they want to share information, it takes like a lot of time in order to, you know, actually get to the to the um, department or the authorities that have that information in order to share. It's like a whole process um, as well. Um, and the other thing is that there are not treaties in between some countries, so that's why they don't share uh, information as well. So those are other things that we have found um, that, as you were mentioning. Uh, between journalists, we share information like immediately, so there is no border, borders when we're talking about uh, investigative um, uh, stories uh, b between journalists. Uh, while in the between authorities, you have like all these uh, obstacles um, to share information, and it takes a lot of time. So no treaties. Therefore, there is a solution there. Uh, make some treaties. Okay, mm -hmm. David. Well, I'm Venezuelan. Well, here we we have speaking. <laughs> As a family, Colombians, Mexicans, and Venezuelans. I'm yeah. from Chile, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but I, I would, rec I mean, uh, there are a, a, a lot uh, courageous uh, people in Venezuela, and journalists and activists, uh, and activists that have been, have been working a lot in order to understand how the state is pretty much taken by criminals and, and operate in that way. So, in, uh, following that, that logic, that I think that there are a lot of uh, amount of evidence supporting that. If not, you can check, for example, the work of uh, Mercedes de Freitas, who is here, and her team. Uh, you should like wave or something, <laughs> so we see you there. <laughs> exactly. So, um, Armando, that info investigations and investigations from a lot of people in Venezuela that uh, produces amount and a amazing amount of evidence on how the state uh, work with a logic that seems <laughs> to, to be conservative uh, uh, as a criminal. So there's no interest in investigations, there's no interest, uh, any interest in collaborating in order to, for example, recover assets or uh, detain people or arrest people that might be uh, involved uh, in some schemes. And uh, uh, what you think is they are supporting actually operations. So, um, I, I have to say that I hear next to Claudia, and you can feel her passion, and you have to clap her, you know, the effort, and in the, the effort uh, uh, she did uh, with her team uh, doing this investigation, and it's the same you feel from many of our partners in the region. I mean, uh, the, for example, uh, C uh, C CNN was a part of the, of the consortium that were working in narcophiles, and uh, there were a team of OCCRP and CNN working uh, on, on uh, an investigation of a huge gang uh, originated in Venezuela that has spread all on, the, on the continent, even in, in USA. Uh, they use the, the, uses the, the, the dramatic migration that uh, Venezuela ha, has faced in recent years in order to uh, explode people that are migrants and then uh, through this vehicle expand uh, operations in countries like yours, Chile, Ecuador, Peru. The name of the gun is the Tren de Aragua and uh, the team that was in charge of that was working like a, more, a year and more just to uh, create a portrait of how this organization has spread and how uh, and uh, what is the, the the scope of the operation of this gang in USA but i mean the 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 partners uh, in latin america in uh, europe they were very pa passionate about the project and they, they, we are talking about just a few examples there are a lot of of cases and specific findings that are you know, overwhelming about the, the project, and I, would like, I, I wanted to, to, to see what you see. You can multiply by 70, or <laughs> I don't know, and that's uh, that what, what okay. we do. So we have passion. We have passionate journalists. But I want to uh, draw up on something that you asked over there, which has to do a bit with impact, right? With impact as in one of the most frustrating things for me ever <laughs> has been to dedicate a year of my life to research something that I'm passionate about, that I think it's important, that I really want to change the world along with my colleagues, and then you publish something that you think is going to change everything. And I don't mean that like a politician is going to step down from elections or nothing like that, but that processes are going to change at the national level, right? That they're going to realize, oh, so the journalist said that here's a problem. Actually, we have a corruption focus here, so uh, let's have due diligence processes or whatever. And nothing happens. It's so frustrating. <laughs> so I want to ask you, with your experience, having seen different levels of impact in different countries, what do we need so that things at least start to change? Should international organizations do something? Should we campaign with uh, government officials? Because that's also something that we're told as journalists we cannot do. We just limit ourselves to inform. So how do we 
because we're not doing this to be cool. We're doing this because we want to help our democracies. So how can, what can we do? How can we push forward impact? Please, if the audience has any idea, we'd be so happy to give you the microphone. We have the last 20 minutes. Yeah, so at OCCRP, we have this partnership with Transparency International. Uh, so as journalists, I think we have to like, keep investigating. That's what we do. Uh, but with this partnership that we have with Transparency International, what they do is that they take our findings and they push for you know, uh, political reforms or, um, yeah, they, they just do that part of the activism that, that we don't do as journalists. So I think that partner um, with different organizations, civil uh, or, uh, organizations that can do that, that part, um, I think that's, that's important. I would like to add, uh, Mm, I think that we, we have to share, as journalists, um, the information with the decision makers in our countries, with the whole stakeholders in the phenomenon that we are uh, reported, reporting about, and try to uh, send a message to that people that can make decisions that transform that, what, that we are revealing. So, uh, our, for, for instance, our donors, we, we share this in investigation with a donor that we have in, in Colombia, it's the Hendrich Ball Foundation from Germany. And they are in contact with the government uh, in, German, uh, uh, in Germany, and, and they shared and spoke about our investigation because that's, that's the, their job. So, that kind of thing, is the things that, that we have to do. It's, it's just, and, and uh, package the information in a really creative way, not only a text, a long text with all the facts and all the, 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 the data. It's, it's just really think like, how can I make this information more sexy to my audience? How can I make, make this information, it's, it's rigorous, it's, it's bulletproof, it's everything, but really, can people can understand and embrace this information and say, okay, this is something that really matters. So that's why when we uh, publish uh, the chipping companies, favorite chipping companies in Colombia, we said, we're gonna make a stop motion Lego videos for this. And the whole distribution campaign in, in Question Publica and OCCRP, all the multimedia pieces, everything was really thinking uh, was a creative uh, team in Question Publica thinking by months on this, how we are going to put and compile all this together and make it sexy for, for the people, for young audiences. Because it's, 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 it's good that uh, the primary minister in, in Germany knows about it in a meeting discussion, uh, informal one, but uh, it's, it's, it's nice that uh, Gustavo Petro, president, Colombian president, mentioned it and, and say that, that there is an, they have to find a new way to, uh, to combat in drug trafficking and everything. But the most important thing is how regular citizens can take this information and, 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 and understand the phenomenon, the, the, whole, the whole picture that uh, I want to say. Lilia. Um, in Mexico, it's very frustrating. Um, la situación de publicar investigaciones de este tipo y que no pase nada. In Mexico it's really frustrating mm -hmm. that we publish this type of, of investigations and really nothing happens. Y la situación o el contexto actual de los medios y de los periodistas es muy eh, difícil y creo que bueno, eh, riesgoso en algunos casos, en algunos estados. No, and the current no situation for journalists and also media is really preca precarious in the country, in mm -hmm. specifically in certain states, regions. Y las autoridades no, um, no están, o sea, no, no quisiera decir que estamos viviendo un arco estado porque es muy fuerte, Pero sí creo, I wouldn't like to say that we're living in a narco state because those are like heavy words, but I do believe. Pero sí creo que hay una gran cercanía entre autoridades corruptas y el crimen organizado. But I do think that uh, the organized crime and corrupted authorities are way too close to each other. Lo que llamamos los facilitadores, ¿no? Los enablers. We call them the enablers, right? Yeah. Yeah. David. Just, just to add. Uh, 
uh, note of optimism. I mean, Yay, the, <laughs> optimism here. The, the lack of impact uh, must not be an excuse for us in order to abandon our, our journey in investigative uh, journalism. I think in some cases, this is, this is a, in some cases, the, the impact of your story, your investigation is not immediate. Uh, and uh, at OCCRP, we have this, you know, email account in which we share everything new. And uh, it's very nice to read how to uh, an investigative journalism in some country that was hope, hopeless when publishing a story, then two years after or three years after, <laughs> uh, uh, re receive a, a, you know, with, with joy the news about changes or some actions of the authorities. And, and I think, yes, we, we, it's not an excuse. We have to overcome the, the, the feeling of frustration and we have to keep going the things because uh, if not, uh, for sure won't be changes. <laughs> I mean, the, I, 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 if you publish and if you expose the situation, if you investigate the, 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 the situations, uh, that we're going to be there. If not, I will say that change will be more difficult or impossible. So we, we have to keep on there. On that. That's actually, remember I told you the name of the documentary, State of Silence? That's actually what happens, right? When you silence journalists, then it's even harder that things change. Yes, over there. Thank you. Kia ora, uh, Julie from New Zealand. Uh, Transparency International New Zealand. I mean, one of the things that I find really um, useful is, and I think you ought, to, it ought to be aware that the impact of the journalism that's happened there also has its fingers down into uh, knowledge both by the police authorities and and at those chains, those end of cha the chain uh, chains of um, sort of drug um, drug exploitation. I mean, that Miesk one. Where, there was a, it was, that was the Maersk boat came into New Zealand and had a huge uh, amount of cocaine directly from there. And I think it's both informing. So you, the story doesn't just sit in your countries, but it extends out through the fingers of the world. And so I think, you, I think there's a good connection there. It's a, it's a way of us telling the story as well about what's happening. Uh, I'm really interested, really inspired, because it's about we can tell the story about what's actually been happening with investigative journalists and how they've actually revealed these, and so how that allows us all to know more about the means. I, I, I was interested in whether you found anything around that that um, uh, the sort of the sort of chain links through to Australian and, and New Zealand gangs, and uh, I mean in some in some cases it was the uh, corruption of port port workers in New Zealand as well. And, and just wondered if, there is, if that was anything that you saw um, in, in your work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in our databases, we didn't um, track uh, to, until there because we are a small team. I mean, we use cross references from different sorts of information, databases of uh, authorities and all that. But uh, we cannot spend a lot of time. I mean, that was a one year in the investigation to, to get uh, the favorite uh, chippings uh, companies, Mafia. But uh, that should be a work for, for the authorities to do it, you know? I mean, we, we, we just made, a, a, for, because our hypothesis was, okay, we're gonna compile a, a very complex and um, whole database with all the categories that are needed to track and, and find out how is the mechanism that, that these people is using. We don't, I, don't, I don't remember if we have something for New Zealand or, or Australia, but uh, I, I just wanted to say that we had, thanks to OCCRP, a partner in um, Denmark, uh, Bel Berliskins is the media. And that's important because we started with Merck's, uh, that the company, we, we, th we uh, even when an ongoing investigation started, that, that's Merck, the favorite uh, chipping company for Colombia's mafia. And there, um, Merck is the main company in Denmark. I mean, it's, it's, uh, they, they, they're close to royal family, everything. So it's, 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 the, it's the economic power, of actually, in Denmark. And we didn't know that uh, from Colombia. But 
thanks to this partner, Berlinski and Michael in, 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 in the uh, Danish uh, media, we, we can really uh, make the whole picture of what is happening. So they made all the, the requests in Denmark to, to uh, um, support and, and support our investigation in Colombia. So I, I think that kind of collaboration is important if maybe uh, we, we want to uh, put a, a, a light on, on what happened in, in, the, in, the, in Australia or New Zealand, that, that could be a good point of a start to uh, connect with media, uh, media, investigative media in that zone, and we can share the database. Yeah, on, on narcophiles in general, we did find um, there was a case on controlled deliveries that connected to Australia, but we couldn't, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the leak was only like the starting point of the investigations, and we couldn't find more information about that case, so that's why we didn't publish, but there was like a lead connected to controlled deliveries. There were leads, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, here, please. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Gabriel Sheposh. Uh, I work uh, for Traffic, the counter wildlife trafficking organization. Um, thank you for your work, for your, for your passion and courage. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to ask about the engagement of uh, overlap of drug trade and wildlife trafficking trade, if, if you've seen any of these cases. And especially I'm wondering, if you could also, if, if there are cases like this, if you could see if there was a different approach taken by, by, the, by the authorities in terms of uh, priority or speed or efficiency or cross-border co collaboration or even corruption, if, if you could tell that those, these cases were investigated but differently from, from those of the drug trade. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, because Colombia is the main uh, cocaine, coca producer in the world, we found a lot of information about drug trafficking, but we also found some um, investigations that were done by authorities on deforestation and legal mining. And we actually published uh, an investigation on shark finning. Um, it was involved the son of the drug lord, of one of the drug lords uh, in Colombia, son of the Cali cartel. Uh, drug lord. He was involved in shark, um, shark fin trafficking. And what we found is that it, they were processing the shark fins, which was something new. Um, and they were planning to export the, the shark fins with uh, swim bladders. Um, authorities in Colombia, um, what I have seen, and I don't know, uh, Claudia, uh, if you have a different perspective, but um, the prosecutors have a lot of experience um, investigating drug trafficking but not much, they don't have like many um, like skills, I guess, in, in identifying, for example, processed shark fins. Um, would you, and, and you need, in this case, you would need like a DNA test in order to, to identify uh, and differentiate the shark fins from the swim bladders. Uh, so, so that's one of the things authorities are more, yeah, I guess because of all the years that we have uh, this problem in Colombia, they have more, more knowledge on, on, on how to investigate drug trafficking. And the other thing that we have found with other investigations, it was not part of, of narcophiles, but we did an investigation in legal mining in Colombia, and we found out that from, there were like 10,000 cases that started an investigation in a period of 10 years, uh, only like 200 ended in a sentence. So do you just see like a difference in, in, um, in the results? Um, I don't know if it's lack of interest in Colombia and they have like put more, more efforts in order to dismantle drug trafficking um, organizations, but uh, I think that's a pending task for authorities to uh, do more things on, on uh, environmental crimes. Here, please, and uh, over there. there. And over there. Okay, um, who was first? She was first? She, okay, go to her. And then we do here and here. We just have six minutes, so be aware of time. I will try to be quick. Hi, I'm Verena Webster. Thank you so much for the interesting workshop. You mentioned earlier that before the end of the investigation, you would reach out to the investigated individuals to comment. And I wanted to ask uh, what precautionary measures you took that to ensure that, first of all, it doesn't end up risking the publication. And then secondly, of course, your personal safety. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, 
protocols. We, we have protocols for, for pretty much every, every step you have to take in order to be secure on the approach. Right? So uh, there are a range of different situations you have to, to, to manage you know, in order to, 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 be, to choose the, the, safest, the safest way to approach. Right? Uh, and of course, if you have an email, an email account, you might prove that way and insist, and th there are some ways in, in order to do it. And you have to assess, uh, and you have to be very cautious if the situation, I mean, you have to assess if the one-to-one -one interview, for example, will, will happen and how and in which terms. And uh, yes, we, we, we have to be very, very cautious on this. But we have protocols uh, that you apply and you, you know, uh, depending on uh, each situation. But if you have an email account or a, a official, yeah, this kind of, of path in order to approach at the first uh, step, uh, you, will, you will choose one this, this way. Uh, of course, we. I think in general, in journalism, you you <coughs> will select very well the moment in which you will approach in order to not put in risk the investigation and the the reporter. These kind of, of situations were evaluated by the committee that we were talking about. The committee was integrated by the you know the chief of the digital security. The chief of physical security, uh, Maria Teresa Rondero from Clip, was the regional chief of the Latin America. I, I was there, like you know, co kind of coordinating and uh, you know creating the breaches and uh, providing quick responses to this kind of situation. I mean, I, I was talking with Daniela yesterday, and I remember receiving a phone calls at you know at night. Telling me, hey, David, <laughs> some sources, you know, trying to approach, uh, trying to to propose us an interview in this place, which is extremely uh, risky. I don't, I am not sure if I, we we have to do that. I mean, we we work with very experienced and trained people, but we we created this mechanism in order to anyone to need to to you know to talk to or, or receive a recommendation. Uh, uh, have uh, uh, the, av the availability of the, of the contact. And these kind of things we happened. Okay, can we uh, get the last questions here? We have three minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Just something very quick yes. that I want yes. to answer um, the question, the previous question. Um, so in order to protect the reporter, uh, to your question, um, if, uh, for example, if, if someone in Mexico needs to uh, send the right of reply to a person they're, they're writing about, um, the letter or the questions would be sent from somebody else that is not in the country, so we don't put at risk the, the reporter on the ground. Um, and we give them usually like two weeks to respond. Uh, it depends on the person that we're reaching out, but we want to give them like enough time uh, to respond, but it depends. Okay, I think there we had someone for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Valbon. I'm a journalist from Kosovo. Uh, is there anything you wished you have done different during your investigation and that from your experience that you could advise us as a young journalist? Thank you. Uh, regarding uh, in general, in a general perspective, something different in general? Well, you have to say it in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it was, uh, I mean, we, we were facing an unprecedented uh, process with a leak. I mean, if you think in the, the big international projects recently published, you, you won't have any other case in which uh, you get 7 million emails from a uh, prosecutor office. We, and this is just the beginning. And so we, we, we were doing something, I think, at the, uh, in, a, in the team that was new. And we uh, uh, had to create the new path in order to approach, in order to manage this, this situation. So uh, Narcofice left, uh, left a lot of learning for us. And we are applying these learnings in other projects. Other projects, right? Yeah. Now. Yes. But, uh, well. No, just one thing that I would actually do again, and I think you would agree on that, is that we did like a lot of 
protocol, security protocols, because of the uh, investigations that we're doing covering organized crime. And I think that uh, for me, as the coordinator of the Latin American reporters, um, having like we didn't receive, like any other reporters who were working on the investigations received any threats, not during the investigations and after publication. So for me, it's a, a success that covering these like really hard topic, nobody uh, got hurt or, you know, any, anybody received threats. So they uh, think that and good. I think in, in our case, in Mexico or Colombia, I think it's necessary to work uh, with other NGOs like uh, Article 19 or something, uh, organizations to add more uh, and spell the word <laughs> or def uh, define them, the, you know, defund them, the information, spread, they, spread the, the investigation. Work. Yeah. Uh, I was just <laughs> going to so, um, uh, the, the information was in Spanish. And we got uh, all the, um, uh, partners from other countries outside Latin America. So maybe uh, OCCRP and, and the coordinators should be put some people that really can connect this uh, um, foreign people from Europe and other uh, countries that don't, doesn't speak Spanish to the Latin American ones, because we as a partners, we have a lot of work and we don't have time to really uh, take care of the, the other findings and ongoing investigation of the other ones in Europe and other countries and the United States, you know? So I will say as a partner that maybe that will be a different, a very huge difference to spread the investigation outside of Latin America and with other partners and in other um, um, languages. Okay, so now I have to finish this. Please give a big, sorry, big uh, clap for okay. our panel. And if you have any further question, Daniela, David, Claudia, Lilia, Paulette, we're very happy to speak to you here having a coffee. Or, and thank you so much for being here at 8.30 in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.